Welcome to I'd Print That. I'm Andrew. I'm Joe. So how was your week, Joe? Busy. Very busy. Uh, wound up getting my new printer a lot sooner than expected. Uh, well, it arrived uh, Wednesday, I believe, is when it came in. I don't remember off the top of my head. But uh, when it arrived, I did a little unboxing and... Uh, I noticed that uh, just after I got it unboxed that one of the belts for the Y-axis, one of the clips was broken on it. Uh, I don't think it was a fault of the manufacturer. I think this happened in shipping because the manufacturer actually tested the unit before it was sent off to me. Mm -hmm. There was a partial print still on the bed. And uh, I contacted them. They're going to send a replacement part for it, so no big deal. I was actually able to uh, go to the store today and get some super glue and uh, at least fix that part temporarily so I can get a couple of prints. It actually prints pretty decently, but it is really, really loud. Yeah, it's that small fan it's got on the little board. Yeah, I think the the solution that I'm going to try first is I'm going to design a little duct for it just to kind of muffle it. I don't think it's anything it's going to take much besides that. I don't think it's going to really uh, hinder the airflow. Mm -hmm. It'll uh, just at least uh, dampen the sound. Yeah. But it, like I said, the, the couple prints I did, I did one of the, an octopus. Uh, I had to swap out filaments halfway through and it had to adjust some temps. But looking at it, there's no Z banding. Uh, it comes with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle, and I printed using their default uh, settings. And their default settings has a 0.35 millimeter first layer and 0.2 millimeter layer height. And it actually came out pretty decently. Yeah, it didn't look bad. No, it really, really didn't. Um, so, other than that, we got contacted from a company called Algix mm -hmm. via our website. They do uh, a lot of sustainable marine stuff. Uh, they deal with fish and other marine life. But one of the things that Algix got into here uh, in the years past is biofuels. Mm -hmm. And in addition to biofuels, they started doing uh, 3D, print 3D printing filament. So they use algae. It's an algae-based filament. And it is uh, biodegradable, non-toxic. And it is a, a PLA. I uh, wound up calling the lady with the company who reached out to us. Spoke with her for a little bit. And she is sending uh, some samples of the algae filament and two of their other filaments. And there's also a filament that they've been developing and I believe they're getting ready to release. They're going to send that with it also. Hmm. So... We'll have some, some additional filaments to, to test and check out. I'm curious to see if the algae will actually smell like a seafood, a little, like a fish market almost. I, I would imagine it does, but it's it's hard to say. Yeah. yeah their site's pretty cool. Um, watching them create their bioplastics was kind of neat. They've got little videos on their process. Mm -hmm. It was pretty cool. Yeah. Seems like a cool company. Yeah, the lady I spoke with, she was actually a uh, like a, a buyer for them or a, a seller for them or something like that and wound up going to work for them as a, a uh, sales distributor. Oh. I believe that's what she, she is. Yeah, I think that's what I read on her email signature. Yeah, if, and if I'm wrong, forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't have my notes in front of me. Well. Yeah. Well. Other than that, I ordered some new nozzles for my Perusa. A couple uh, sets of nozzles that range from 0.4, or excuse me, 0.2, all the way up to 0.5 mil. So it's 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and 0.5. And I've been working on getting my my printer recalibrated because the nozzle distances, uh, the distance between the two nozzle tips, is a little bit different than the stock. GTEC nozzles. Mm -hmm. So I've been trying to do some dual color prints and it's not playing nice right now. So I've got to 
Also, bed leveling takes a uh, a big point in when you switch up your nozzle diameter mm-hmm. because the your extrusion width it width doesn't change, but the amount of it, it's extruding that ne- it needs to to make the correct extrusion width width will change so yeah. keep that in mind anytime you change the nozzle um you need to level your bed to the appropriate size with a feeler gauge or paper whichever you use yep yeah i uh i did that because the nozzles are also just a little bit i think they were a little bit taller oh. and it was interesting the uh it's like a seven millimeter uh socket for the nozzles for the uh that's big for the other, yeah, for the default GTEC, mm-hmm. and these were smaller than that. Yeah, because I think my E3D is only like a three point five mil or four. Yeah, I think this is probably around four or five millimeters. Yeah, uh, I haven't actually tested. I just used a uh, crescent wrench. Mm. I didn't have a an actual so- metric box end wrench <laughs> that would fit. In addition to that, uh, I did something that I swore I would probably never do. I can't say would never do. I am very... Uh, I'm not real big into social media. I've said this in the podcast a few times in the past. Uh, I signed up with Twitter and Instagram this last week. Anything else? Let's see. I was introduced to a new gentleman uh, Chris, I, I keep wanting to say Curtis, it's Cecil, Chris Cecil. Uh, he used to work for Trinity Labs, uh, has a, uh, an outfit called Robo Sprout. He pretty much deals with the smoothie boards now. He does quality control and stuff for them. He's based out of the area. And I went over, talked with him. He's got some pretty large format printers. He's 320 mil cubed was, I think, the biggest one that he has, but... Pretty cool looking little machines. The 320 cubed machine is all gear driven, no belts, and uh, built with aluminum extrusion. It is a beast of a machine. You and I, uh, you weren't able to go. You had some some work things that kept you occupied, but I think this coming week you and I need to go over to his shop, sit down, chat with him. He's full of knowledge. He's one of the uh, ops also in the Rep Rap IRC channel. Yeah. Yeah, that um, uh, that gear-driven printer, I was actually looking back when I was kind of deciding on which printer I wanted to build myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was looking at all lead screw-driven. Um, mm-hmm. uh, in my point of view, it, it takes out all the inaccuracies that a belt can give you. The one that's all uh, lead screw-driven, it's all lead screws, uh, not gears. That thing is a monster. Dual power supplies... Uh, and he only uses three mil filament, actually. A lot of people do, and the, the, when they get into large, because he prints a lot of large prints, mm-hmm. um, it's just the volume is more there for them. And actually, uh, when I asked, because I, I I was curious, I asked, you know, why uh, why three mil, not one point seven five? And the reason he gave me was less bind ups. Mm. The filament's not going to bind up as easy because it's a larger diameter and it's not going to get crossed up and wound around itself. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't see any Bowden machines. They're all direct drive. Uh, it doesn't mean that he doesn't use them, but he has... Dude, he does some big, big prints. It's uh, pretty crazy. Yeah, his uh, Rook... I don't re- I don't remember the exact uh, uh, measurements on it, but it was 320 millimeters tall. Yeah, it was nuts. Yeah, he's got a uh, actually some videos of the, him printing that on his site, which we'll link to off of our site. Uh, and he's also got a YouTube page too, yep. or YouTube channel rather. Mm-hmm. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, check him out. He's got some cool prints. He doesn't talk in any of his videos. Uh, most of them are just either time lapses or um, just straight video of his printer running. Yeah, and he's- if you're listening to this, there's a good chance that you like to watch printers run, so you might enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, and uh, he, one of the one of the videos he has out there is one of his machines printing at uh, 200 millimeters per second, which is pretty quick for a machine. Mm-hmm. That pretty much covers it for me this week. Uh, how about you? 
Um, I started up uh, the modified DaVinci, started printing, trying to print, um, uh, words, uh, the Marvin the, from 3D Hubs. Right. Um, the test print that they give you mm-hmm. when you open up a hub. Uh, your first order is uh, from 3D Hubs, and it's their little Marvin keychain. You print them with uh, the best resolution you can, uh, no additional adhesion other than his feet touching the build plate, um, no support. And I was trying to just print him out because it it's not a trying print. There are a few trying overhangs um, uh, where his legs come together. There's not a lot there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he wears like a little helmet thing, and that kind of just bumps out from his face. So I was thinking, that's that's a good, it's an 18-minute print All right? Um, at 2 millimeter with 20% infill. Um, I was having really a really hard time still with that printer. Uh, unfortunately, I don't get a lot of time. In, in, the only time I get to do it is after my kids go to bed at mm-hmm. night. And so it's like nine thirty, ten o'clock. I still got to work the next day, so I get a couple hours of playing with it. Um, so other than that, I mean, I, I cleaned up the one printer from Never Use Aerosol um, Craft Bond glue. Oh, <laughs> you're still cleaning that up? Yeah, uh, you. If you ever do it, you will end up using acetone, and it peels off. I don't know if you've ever used Plasti Dip ever uh yeah Um, i've I've dipped a few tool handles but i mean that's that's about the extent of that if you get the paint the the rattle can paint spray paint Uh um uh, and you spray anything with it you peel it right off Mm -hmm. it's it's kind of like that other than it doesn't want to come off ever at all you said it was what two episodes ago you said don't use it and yeah you're still fighting it huh uh, well, most for the most part, I didn't touch that printer for a while. Right. And actually, that printer's going to go down the road. Uh, I'm going to sell that one. So, anybody listening, there's a DaVinci 1.0 with Repetier 0.92 on it that's going to be going up for sale. Check Craigslist in North Idaho. Or uh, get a hold of us through the site. Yep. More than happy to ship it. Um, we'll work something out. But other than that, a um, few failed Marvins, a lot of bed leveling, um, still having an issue with the the 1.0A, the, the modified printer, mm-hmm. and the bed being warped. I tried to shim it and use it to where uh, I could use the screws that tighten the bed down and uh, just kind of take the warp enough out of it that I can get a print out of it. And also, I was only printing in the center. The Marvin's fairly small. Um still having problems i don't know if i can chalk it up to bed issues other than i'm still trying to uh get the e3d v6 hot end dialed in all the way Mm -hmm. at no fault of the hot end they're amazing um uh, their design is awesome and they're tried and true Uh, i'm actually looking at getting uh they just came out e3d just came out with a new extruder so the cold end end of the hot end it's just a literal bolt-on uh, uses four bolts, and you can actually use the extruder gear or the mm-hmm. uh, extruder stepper as mounting point, which I got on uh, Voltivo. Uh, Voltivo dot com. They do uh, high high accuracy filaments, but they also have a forum. And if you own a DaVinci, you should really be checking them out because they have an entire forum dedicated to DaVinci, DaVinci one point the AIOs, the Duos. Um, the guy that made the Repetier firmware for mm-hmm. custom flashing, Luck, is actually home. I, I guess I can't say home base because a forum is not a place to live. But because um, he also dabbles in Solo Forum, which is um, another good good avenue to go and get some user to user support and advice. Um, that's where Luck came from. And that's he posts all of his builds there, all of his firmware builds, any of his advice, and he's an endless wealth of knowledge. I'm surprised mm-hmm. XYZ hasn't hired him. They probably should. Um, but other than that... We could do consulting for him also. He I know, possibly could. Um, I don't know. GTEC's using... I think they're using a lot of the information they're going to be getting from myself and you uh, back on this Me Creator 2 
and if you stay in contact with them, uh, they're they've got they're actually pretty decent about getting back to you, to you with questions, comments, and feedback. So I think a lot of that they take and use to make their their uh, hardware better. I know there's a couple of things with when I was going through and setting it up. There's a few discrepancies in their manuals mm. and in their firmware. So uh, it doesn't surprise me that, you know, if he has spotted something and has made comment to them or has come up with some improvements that they haven't used that information they've gotten. Hmm. So It's kind of like M3D uh, mm -hmm. in our, the way, the way I came up with uh, their uh, backlash. backlash. Yes. The, the way I came up, uh, our friend that works in the 3d printers printing industry said, Hey, can you write up a paper on that? And then he handed it to them and, I don't know if they're using it. I haven't checked their forums or anything on on how to do it or how they're doing Backlash anymore. I actually think they took Backlash out away from the end user. Um, uh, uh, the last firmware I saw, they just moved its location. Oh. It's still there. But it's also, I don't know how the software has progressed since we got rid of our M3Ds. It's mm -hmm. been a few months. Yeah. Uh, it could uh, They could have pulled it. I just... I don't have any info on I don't that. see why they... I, they would be... It, it, nothing against M3D. They're still a great company and put out a great little machine for introducing yourself into the hobby. Uh, it would be foolish of them to pull something like that out of their software. Yeah, there's... I don't think that they would do something like that, especially with the uh, the issues with Backlash that they've had. Yeah. But that's about it for me. Um uh, my printer's due to be here Monday. Um, so I've been pretty much waiting for that in Overwatch, which is Tuesday. So. <laughs> well, actually, yeah. Monday, Monday night. I got I got a little excited here uh, the, on the 19th. I got my code, so I put that in, and I noticed on the launcher they had an uh, updated uh, map of the U.S. that indicated something was going to happen on the 20th at 4 o'clock uh Pacific time, our mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. and it wound up just being them releasing another comic and a, some an infographic, uh, which, if you haven't checked out the Overwatch infographic and you played it Overwatch or you're curious at all, it is pretty impressive the amount of people that were in their uh, open beta. You know, something like 4.9 million people uh, were, were logged in. Oh, it was nuts. Their, their numbers for... And it's kind of weird the things they tracked, but it's cool to see, like uh, games completed, uh, how many meters the payload moved uh, throughout the entire beta. It was it was pretty cool. Yeah, it was pretty awesome. It's there's a lot of lot of stuff there. I think there was an average of eight player changes per match. Oh yeah, uh, changing your character. Correct. Yeah, character changes. Yeah. But when you have, what, 20, 21 characters? Yeah, 21 heroes, I think it was. <laughs> Changing eight times is nothing. <laughs> and possibly another one, they, um, I don't remember where I read it. It was on my Google feed um, that they had nonchalantly, I guess you could say hinted at it, but um, there's a character, a hero in one of their videos that's mm -hmm. kind of in the dark. You can't see him. Um, but yeah, there's, there's talk of a new character or hero, uh, coming with the release on the 24th. Interesting. I saw a thing on the Overwatch Twitter feed, actually, uh, one of the, uh, either a fan's daughter or somebody who works at Blizzard's, their daughter or their kid, I, I, uh, drew up this picture and they wound up taking, uh, that picture and modeling it with some concept art for an actual character in Overwatch. Hmm. It was interesting. I uh, have to have to link that one also. So, yeah. Um, i trying to think if there's anything else that has happened, has gone on. No, oh, not for me. So, no. Here, uh... Yeah, I think it was yesterday. My friend Jay, 
uh, clued me into a little article. I'm a, I'm an advocate for animals, and you have animals. Mm-hmm. And I uh, kind of thought this was pretty interesting because if you speak with any conservationist, you'll find out real quick that those little plastic six-pack rings are their bane. And they have been forever. Oh, yeah. Images of seabirds and turtles entangled in them uh, serve as a constant reminder that uh, our consumer culture and environment don't always get along. And the article details that an innovation from a Florida-based brewery uh, will at least make us feel a little bit better about enjoying a six-pack. Saltwater Brewery has partnered with the ad agency We Believers to create what they say is the first fully edible beer can packaging made from byproducts, excuse me, made from byproducts of the brewing process such as wheat and barley. Their six-pack holders are fully biodegradable and completely digestible. Rather than ensnaring curious animals with a corset of litter, the company's six-pack rings could serve as a satisfying snack. And if nothing is bitten, the rings quickly decompose. Hmm. Plus, the drink holders are just as strong as a plastic variety, which should keep those screaming reels nice and safe as well. That's cool. The company has 3D printed a test batch of 500 holders in April, and according to Advertising Age... It plans to scale up production to meet their current output of 400,000 beer cans a month. While the edible holders are more expensive to make, Saltwater Brewery wants to set an example for other beer producers and encourage them to adopt the idea. They say if their edible holders become commonplace, they could potentially be as cheap as regular plastic rings. Hmm. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately you won't see... Big brand, big store brewers do it, but uh, it's cool to see. Um, if if there's enough uh, if there's enough pushback, you may, and especially if it's a biodegradable and edible thing. It also you also see, I would almost guarantee on Pinterest recipes for <laughs> the, the beer oh, can yeah. rings. So next thing you know, you're gonna come home tonight and be, honey, what's for dinner? Beer can rings. Beer can rings. Oh, boy. <laughs> I already eat enough crap I don't like. Uh, so. so we've talked about this in the past. Um, we've, had, we've been looking at the mostly printed CNC machine. Mm-hmm. So a multi-purpose... Uh, device that does routing, CNCing, printing, etc. Uh, and we know that a uh, a hybrid like that is a digital manufacturer's dream. And while we're both kind of excited, some tinkerers may have reservations about such a device. So if you're a company and you're going to build and sell such a machine, you Definitely want to uh, prove that the machine is more than just a jack-of-all-trades. And a Polish 3D printing manufacturer, Zmorph, is doing so. Mm -hmm. Zmorph has been exploring the possibilities of combining digital fabrication technologies within a single machine and last month brought those years of experience together for its latest product, the Zmorph 2.0 SX Multi-Tool 3D Printer. The $2,690 machine had many customers salivating, but to understand the quality of such a gadget and rid oneself of any lingering skepticism, they needed to provide a closer look at the fruits of its labor. With it, Zmorph has been putting together a cool little sample pack for its business partners and clients designed to showcase each of the 3D printer's many talents. 
The special sample pack consists of a multi-headed Star Wars wine stopper and a wooden display box. 3D printing, CNC milling, and laser cutting techniques were all used to create the components of the pack. Hmm. The 3D printed stopper, which consists of a cork element and two interchangeable heads, R2-D2 and Darth Vader, was designed on the company's Zmorph 2.0 SX software with the cork element printed in NinjaFlex Semiflex filament through a plastic extruder and the fancy Star Wars heads printed in Zmorph ABS for R2-D2 and Zmorph PLA for Darth Vader and a little color fab glow fill filament was used to make the Sith Lord's eyes glow in the dark. The beautiful beechwood case was sculpted using the hybrid machine's CNC mill, creating perfect hollow areas for, or excuse me, creating perfect hollow areas in the wood for the 3D printed wine stoppers. Before the company's name, logo, and landing page were engraved into the showcase piece using the machine's built-in laser cutter. The final touch is a clasped strap around the box, also 3D printed in NinjaFlex filament and Zmorph PLA. For those who aren't Zmorph partners, they plan on making the designs available for the sample pack available online. Some info about the Zmorph 2.0 SX 3D printer. It has interchangeable nozzles, tool heads, and work tables. It boasts a 250 by 235 by 165 millimeter working area. It is capable of 14 microns XY precision with 0.625 microns Z position and will do 50 to 400 microns of resolution. It also has a heated work table with 5 millimeter hardened glass. Hmm. Let me see. Kind of a cool little all-in-one guy. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of kind of interested. The price tag is a little bit big on it, but I mean, if you're looking at doing a mostly printed CNC machine, by the time you buy all your print heads and your laser cutters and your uh, little rotozip hand Dremel-y type tool, mm-hmm. uh, you're probably going to be up there in the several hundred dollar range. Oh, easily. And that doesn't include any software or anything like that. And so this is a this is an all in one machine, and at you know twenty six hundred bucks, it's I don't think it's that bad. If you're in the market, yeah. Unfortunately, I I see a lot of printers and a lot of these uh, at home CNCs being in that price range, mm-hmm. and it's going to be hard for people to to grab. It will be, uh, but I saw an article that shows that a lot of the uh, 3D pre- 3D patents on uh, the uh, liquid resin-based printables and the powder-based printables are expiring. Mm-hmm. So that's going to help drive the prices down on these printers even more. Yeah. When the the patents for FDM came out or expired and uh, MakerBot and Ultimaker could start making machines, your FDM printers went from $10,000 to, you know, in the thousands of mm-hmm. dollars. So it's yeah, that's just going to help drive prices down. Unfortunately, uh, when I was speaking with Chris, one thing that he made comment on is, you know, 3D printing right now is a race to the bottom. Who can have the cheapest machines with the most bells and whistles? And when you're looking at buying a printer, cheap is not always the best way to go. You need to keep in mind uh, the support you're going to get from it, the... Uh, quality of the build of the machine and what resolutions it'll handle. Yeah. I mean, that's just a few of the things to keep, keep in mind. If it's a, if it's proprietary, you're probably not going to have a very long life because right now, like with uh, the Cubify from 3d systems, when they stop making that, 
those people who had one because it is a proprietary machine were kind of left stranded. Mm -hmm. They might be able to find replacement parts or filament or something out there, but they really don't have much else to go and are probably going to have to wind up buying a new machine or figuring out how to reverse engineer and make the machine accept other parts. Yeah, and that's the beauty of the 3D printing community. It's bound to happen, just like Da Vinci's getting uh, non-proprietary firmware. Right. Someone bought it because it's a $500 printer and it's a grabbable thing, but they realize it's not exactly what they wanted, just like I wouldn't say everybody. There's a lot of people that are happy with what a Da Vinci can put out just as it is and buying their filament and... I don't. I don't see Da Vinci going or X Y Z going away. No, they've actually stepped up their game quite a bit. And there's a lot of ways that you can get around some of these proprietary things just with a mainboard swap. Mm -hmm. If you look, there's a lot of forums on how to integrate an Arduino or a smoothie board into these things. That when it's swapped out, you know, all you need to do is hook up your motors. Give it a little bit of programming, and it you know, I'm making it sound simple, but it does work. It will require some time, some headache, but once you do it, you now have a machine that you're not bound to a manufacturer's uh, proprietary software, filaments, things like that. Mm -hmm. That's that's the beauty of the internet and information age we're in now you're not alone and there's really good chance that someone's already done it and you can either follow them and, and improve upon if you need but we most of the when i flashed the da vinci i did exactly what someone else did worked for me and since i've um, since then i've improved uh, improved upon it a little bit but not much yeah it's just it's it's nice to have a community Obviously, people that have printers are already handy with software and tech. And um, so, I mean, there's uh, luck. I mean, that guy is, he's like savant level yeah. smart. And that's why you, know, you want to be part of the, you know, the Voltiva forums, get into the RepRap IRC channel. Mm -hmm. There's a slew of really smart people. And you can throw your questions out and say, hey, I have X printer. I want to do this with it. What would you suggest? Yeah. Don't don't go out and buy all the hardware and then ask the questions. Ask the questions, get informed, then spend the money. Because you may buy the hardware that you want to do the that task with, but it might not work and you're going to just wind up throwing money out the door. Mm -hmm. And a lot of places, you know, may or may not take that part back, but I wouldn't count on it. I like being smart with my money and really doing my research, finding out, is this what I want to do? Is this going to work? And then investing in it. Yeah. So we're not shy about saying it. We like Star Wars, and I have a little bit of Star Wars trivia for you. Oh. Uh, maybe maybe even the listeners. Do you know Mark Hamill, Luke Skywalker, has only experienced Star Wars on the big screen? He has never watched it on a TV? Did not know that. Yeah. Evidently, uh, here on... What he's on... not saying is he probably has a big screen in his house. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually, no, it's... Uh, it, it, the uh, he tweeted out here on Tuesday that that is the only way he has seen it is in the theater. Hmm. It's uh, and the last time that he has saw any of the original trilogy was in the mid '90s when the special editions were released. Wow. Yeah. He I guess did. it's one of those things like um, you listen to it a lot more than I do because you edit, but I I generally don't. I, it's like I was there. All right. Like, why? <laughs> yeah, I, and it's not. Uh, and he, fans have asked him to why he doesn't watch the films yet on the small screens, but he hasn't responded. Mm. So it's kind of interesting. And also, he did uh, he did say that he saw the prequels on the big screen as well, even though he wasn't in them. 
Well, of course. It you don't have to be in it to be a fan. Well, no. <laughs> well, yeah, that's uh was a very interesting little little tidbit of information. He's actually a really uh, follow him on Instagram, and uh, I imagine he does a lot more on Twitter than he does mm-hmm. Instagram. But what he does post on Instagram, I mean, he's just an all around. Just seems like a cool guy. Um, I listened to a podcast with uh, him with Kevin Smith. I think it was a Fat Man on Batman. Okay. Uh, he did a guest spot, and. R- he was there not because of Star Wars. He was there because the he played, yes, he was the voice of the Joker in the animated series, which, mm-hmm. great series. I need to go back and watch it again. But the his voice for the Joker was just top-notch. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he actually talks about his past acting, how he got into it, a little about Star Wars, and... That cat, man, he does a lot of stuff. He's done a lot of stuff. Uh, he's definitely, I don't think you'd you know, peg him as being kind of a, uh, I don't want to mean to, uh, I don't mean to offend or anything if, you know, Mark happens to listen or hear this or somebody gets back to him. Uh, very kooky and odd individual. Eccentric. E- eccentric is kind of the right word, uh, but it's really funny. Uh, I enjoy listening to his stories. He is a very animated person, telling the stories at least. So, yeah, it's you know like like we said last week. You know, the saying is, "Don't never meet your heroes." Mm-hmm. This is one guy uh, yeah, I would I, really like to yeah. meet. <laughs> I don't care. I don't even care if he pissed me off. I, <laughs> he couldn't. But like this picture here. It's from Instagram. Oh, yeah. Him and Daisy? Yeah. He's on her back like Yoda was it's, on his. Her name's Daisy, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Daisy, Daisy Ridley? Yes. Uh, I've seen the movie only a couple of times. I don't I don't quite know all the actors' names yet. Yeah, but it, it's a picture of him riding on Daisy Ridley's back and him pointing, like, leading her the way. Well, and, it's like Yoda. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's just, I mean, it's it's, it's neat to see. I mean, he's, he's a very, um, very helpful man to his communities that he believes in. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely have a beer with Mark Hamill. Oh, definitely, definitely have one. And I would drink beer, so <laughs> that's saying a lot. Yeah. No, it's not. Uh, that's incorrect. It's not that I don't drink beer. I infrequently drink beer. I'm I'm not a fan of beer. I just the taste is uh, a little much for me. I like the, the ciders and things like that. And I like IPAs. So <laughs> you like them bitter? Yes, very bitter. <laughs> Uh, we've got uh, a friend at work who likes them dark. Yes, and I, I uh, will drink a porter or a stout, um, but I'm definitely more of. I like to drink something that's, I guess you could say, refreshing. Mm-hmm. And the IPAs, especially when they have like the um, the citrus notes from the hops, mm-hmm. um, it's just good. I like I, I but I like the taste of beer. I mean, I'm a beer snob, but I will also drink Coors Light. I don't care. I like the taste of beer. <laughs> Speaking of which, uh, I got to bring you up to see. I think it's Elk Mountain Farms. Where's that? That's up in uh, up on the border. Okay. It's they grow hops there. Mm. That's where Budweiser. Uh, it's their primary hops. One of their hops farms. But they also sell hops to others. I've seen a couple of ads where uh, somebody made comment that they get their hops from Elk Mountain Farms. And I'm like, hey, I've been there. I know this place. <laughs> yeah, I've been to, um, eh. well, in Yakima, they grow, most of the nation's hops mm-hmm. are grown in Yakima, Washington. And my previous job, uh, we had a fiber plant in Yakima. So I, I, um, and that was one of my areas that I covered and maintained. Um And actually, previous to that, when I was a subcontractor doing telephone, I put in um, uh, for CenturyLink, actually it was CenturyTel then, Mm -hmm. uh, I put in copper lines to 
the main grower for Anheuser Busch. Mm-hmm. So I mean, uh, all of Anheuser Busch's beer. Um, right. And then I can't remember the other company. Um, but they are so like the the type of hops that go in Anheuser Busch's beer and n- naming the one really um, Budweiser. Yeah. Um, nobody else can get those hops. Yeah. They have a patent on that hop, um, that strain or strain, if you will. I think um, you can. I think they resell them, but yeah, you can't grow them. They're yeah. the only ones that grow them. You can't. Um, uh, who was it? Uh, it was a podcast I used to listen to called uh, The Brewers Network. Mm-hmm. And they tried to get a hold of some, and they literally went to Yakima. They're, they're out of L.A. They mm-hmm. went to Yakima, and they did a podcast there. And they were talking. They went to this same building that I went to mm-hmm. and tried to get some. And they were like, no, we don't sell it all. Uh, these hops are grown for Anheuser-Busch and Anheuser-Busch only. Yeah, they've got... Anheuser Busch has such a ridiculous stock of this these hops. Mm-hmm. It's yeah, the apocalypse could happen, and they could be making beer well into the future. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, they pelletize them for the most part. Yeah, um, I remember yeah. the first time I uh, my old boss who got me into brewing beer, he showed me his hops. I'm expecting I'm expecting the little pine cone, and no, it doesn't look like alfalfa pellets that you feed a horse. <laughs> wow, yeah, it's I don't didn't know if you had uh, seen the hop. Uh, hop growing operation or not i know i'm gonna i plan on taking becky up there at some point but one of the times when we go on, north i saw it on um dirty jobs but you've never actually not in person no in person scene um but yeah it's it's funny that came up to play again because it was a few episodes ago we were talking about micro mm-hmm. um yeah it, he did an episode and he said like d- the drying room the smell was like just over overwhelming like, just like <laughs> I, I can't do this um and this is the guy that stood over the vats at the tabasco plant mm-hmm. and and he was crying obviously because it's a million tons of peppers below him oh well, it's and, like uh, uh he went to work at a maggot farm yeah which also is was in is in north idaho oh really yeah where at? uh that's in the bonner's fair area I think it's around Moye or north of Moye. Oh, okay. So, but yeah, it's, you know, maggots grow in rotting flesh or, or just rotting things. Mm-hmm. And yeah, he's like, yeah, that could knock a buzzard off a barf Anything. wagon. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, it's, uh, for him to say, nope, that's too much. It's got to be something pretty, uh, <laughs> pretty strong. You gotta, you know, stand your hair on end. But uh, I just ran across an article. Um, actually, this entire time I've been trying to find that printer and I gave up. Open builds, like their page of their builds, has blown up. When mm. I first started looking at them, there was like five printers. All right. <clears throat> I've been scrolling for about 20 minutes now, and I haven't found it. But I ran across an ad, uh, 3D print a gummy version of your face and eat it. <laughs> so that, that's worth a, a tap. Interesting, yeah. It looks like a, a paste extruder, paste style extruder. And that's another thing that uh, uh, Chris Chris had done. He made a, a frosting-based uh, print, printer mm-hmm. and a paste printer. Yeah, and he was, pa- he was printing in ceramics. Yes, yeah, the paste was a ceramic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I saw that. Uh, we looked through his Flickr page, um, or feed, repository. Lots of pictures right. um, for a while. He's got a lot of neat stuff. Uh, we'll probably link that in the, uh, the yeah, bio. Yeah, I'm going to link uh, his site, and from there you'll be able to go to his uh, his videos and his photos. It's uh, it, it, he actually had the um, the frosting that he printed. The, the it's little a, Mayan like a, temple. Yeah, a little Mayan pyramid, and then the the paste stuff that he had printed actually sitting on a shelf there. So, oh, did he? Yeah. He said it was actually pretty pretty interesting little little project that he yeah. did. It's kind of cool. Magic candy factory. <laughs> cool. Now, are we talking psychedelics magic? 
candy, mm, or are say, we talking? I wouldn't say The Verge would cover it if it was psychedelics. I mean, oh, okay. only if the people went to prison. <laughs> but um, it depends. They could be in Amsterdam or okay. some other place. That's what it looks like when you 3D print your face. Oh, that's in interesting. Gummies. It's just a little. Uh, Here's one that you like. There's a little octopus silhouetted like thing. Oh yeah, a little frog and a snowflake, and oh, uh, the octopus I've been printing. That's mm-hmm. cool. I wonder, uh, I, I'm still really curious about 3D printed foods. How yeah. does it, you know, is it, is the taste there or is it just kind of meh? It's, it's, I imagine in the beginning it's going to leave a lot to be desired. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm very curious to see XYZ's big food printer that they put at CES. Um, I've seen a few pictures of that. And I think we spoke about it right after CES happened. Right, yeah, we just, we went over some of their some of their things, and they didn't have a price tag on that one, but yeah, they uh, they announced a three D f- uh, printer for food. Mm hmm. Um, and actually, our friend uh, that we know, uh, w- which was at CES, uh, checked it out and saw it, and he actually, I don't think he was able to see it print food. He said, I don't think he said it was running most of the time. He saw it, but um, there was definitely, I think, in the article. Uh, they were saying they printed something. I can't remember what it was. <laughs> I think it was printing in chocolates or something. Yeah. But, I mean, they're, it's already coming because they're already growing meat in uh, the hamburger thing. Right. Uh, that was a while ago that that came about. Gaming-wise, um, I haven't really gamed a bunch. I uh, I tried. Uh, Overwatch kind of ruined me. <laughs> um, I tried to go back and I tried to play some Call of Duty a few days ago um, in my ro- my old roommate's over at my house tonight. And so we'll, we'll probably end up playing some tonight. But it's like, uh, you're not the same. You're not as fun. <laughs> no, it really isn't. I actually uh, I started playing some of the Nathan Drake collection on my PS4. So I've... I, uh, when I had my PS3, I was going through, I completed the first Uncharted, and I was over halfway through Uncharted 2, and my hard drive just died. And I decided, screw it, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go through and redo this. Well, they remastered and re-released uh, Uncharted 1, 2, and 3 for the PS4, mm. and with Uncharted 4 coming out, or being out, I can't remember if it's out yet or not, I decided, eh, I've got this game, may as well uh, go ahead and go through it. And in the course of a day, I went and I'm back to where I, actually farther than where I was when I had stopped last time. And I'm right up at the end. I think I'm in chap- up to chapter 13. So I've been having some fun playing that one. Uh, I got a little bit tired of Fallout. It's getting kind of monotonous for me. I'm just... I want the game to be over with, uh, sadly. Uh, once you get to a certain point with some of the factions, it's just a lot of repeating quests. Mm-hmm. It's very grindy, and I don't, I don't like grindy games. Hence the reason I don't play any story mode games because I just I get bored too easy with them. I, it's it's not that you know yeah I, I'm kind of bored with it but why have that as why have that element there's no need to grind in this game yeah you're not making friends once you're to a point you already are friends with them yeah. you don't get really any benefits from it uh, they could have just focused on hey I'm done I don't need any more things. And that NPC could ignore you or, you know, have maybe a special item or, or two every now and again. Rather than just have this NPC, you know, go get technical documents. All right, there's a continuing quest. Go mm-hmm. get vi- uh, viable blood samples, continuing quest. Go get this piece of technology, a continuing quest. Go check on the safe house, a continuing quest. It's just over and over. Hey, there's a settlement that needs your help. It just gets boring. Uh, have you done any of the DLC? I don't plan on be- get, picking up any of the DLC for it. 
That's uh, actually the reason my old roommate came over. He's like, hey, can I come use your internet and get some DLC? And I said, yeah, sure. You're more than welcome to. And uh, he's picking up the Aut- Automatron. Yep. And then... Lost Harbor or Long Harbor. I think he, he was talking about Lost Harbor or whatever. Yeah, Lost Harbor. Ha- something Harbor. Harbor boats, things. Yeah. Um, but I don't know if he's going to or not. Um, did he get the uh, season pass? I don't think he did. Okay. He he may have. Um, he's a he's a diehard Fallout fan. And uh, he plays it. He plays them all through the end always, and he usually plays them multiple times. Um, <laughs> I can't. This is the same guy that I was trying to play Skyrim with, and he's like, "Go here, look at that." I'm like, Mm-mm, "I'm bored." <laughs> yeah, and I'm gonna go kill this guard. I it, it drives drives Becky nuts. I have to search everything and. I have fun doing it. I mean, there's a lot of cool little things out there. They put a lot of detail in the games, and I like I like seeing the attention to detail. But when it comes to stories, either make the quest useful or cut it out. Yeah, <laughs> useless quests, grindy quests, really bug me. I don't mind. Doing a couple of them, but good God, (laughs) really, when you get, you know, after you do four or five of these things, they they get really old really fast. Mm -hmm. That's why I don't play them, because they get really old really fast in the beginning for me. Like, I played, I got, I think my character's still standing on top of the vault. So you got out of the vault. I got out of the vault. That's it. That doesn't take much to get out of the vault. No, I just got bored. It's like, okay, <laughs> this happened. I'm like, okay, that's cool. And then they're like, then this happened. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, crap. I wish my daughter wasn't standing there when that happened, but she was. Yeah. Um, and then, and then they killed the kid, and then they killed the mom, and I was like, oh, that that's bad. Well, <laughs> and they, then, they stole the kid. And oh killed yeah, the they mom. stole the kid. Yeah. Anyway, um, but no, I was no, just, no spoilers there. Yeah. Um, I was like. This is just not my game. This is I. I hate the. Oh look, there's a point. I gotta run there. No, I want to kill things. And I've been told that you don't have to. You don't even have to play the quest. You can just explore and kill things. And I'm yep. like, yeah, but. Eh. I guess another another one of it for me is I've never played any of the others, and I guess you don't have to be that way. Uh, but I like to be. Like Call of Duty, I've played Call of Duty since it was a thing, and I know I know the storylines. Um, I I can see the throwbacks to old Call of Duties, um, and that's fun. And for me to step into Fallout Four, and there and because my old roommate was like, "Oh yeah, that was in Fallout Three. That guy." And they're referring to Fox, your old, your old uh, super mutant guy. And I'm like, right. "Cool, I don't get it." <laughs> And that's the thing, is they add things like that, but really, the game is standalone. There's, yeah, yeah they, they talk about, um, uh, th- you're in the Commonwealth, but they talk about the um, Capital Wasteland. And that was the setting for Fallout 3, Capital Wasteland being uh, the capital, D.C. Okay. So you get to see... All the things that are there, uh, museums, monuments, things like that, that have been ravaged by war. Mm-hmm. It's uh, fun, pretty awesome, really cool. Uh, I don't know. Did you get? Oh, you did. You got it on PC. I didn't get it. It was actually uh, I share my Steam library with a guy at work. Okay. And he was like, "Yeah, go ahead and play it." And I was like, "Okay." Did he get a copy of Fallout Three along with it? I have no idea. Uh, the guy has like 300 games in his library. Fallout so 3 sure is a good one to start it. at. Yeah. Fallout 3 is a really good one to start. Mm. You don't... Because the Fallout 2 and Fallout 3 are two completely different games. Wasn't 2 New Vegas? No. No, that's like 3.5. Okay. Uh, but Fallout and Fallout 2 were uh, kind of... Uh, turn-based role-playing games. Okay. Uh, so you have the three-quarter top-down view like you would in Diablo. Mm-hmm, like an ARPG type. Correct. And you would just go do quests and do things. 
Fallout 3 brought into a first person mode and kind of not kind of it really rebooted the the franchise. Okay. There might be some references to Fallout 2 and Fallout, but I really I didn't pay that much attention because I was too busy going, "Ooh, that's a thing. Oh my god, there's a thing over there." Ooh, ooh. <laughs> yeah, really excited for the game. I played many, many, many hours. Again, didn't play in the DLCs, but really uh, I like the main games and by the time the DLCs are released, uh I'm on to another game. Mhm. And uh, uh, I have an issue with DLCs anyway. Yeah. You know, I, I'm buying a game, and now you're selling me additional content for that game. Mm-hmm. I just really saw it once. <laughs> I'm, I'm a crotchety old man when it comes to that. You know, when Back in my day when you bought a game, you bought the game, and the game came complete. Pepperidge Farm remembers. Exactly. <laughs> you know what really grinds my gears? <laughs> yeah. Get off my lawn while you're at it. <laughs> So yeah, I um, I just I think that's just a clever way to soak more money from oh yeah from people, especially when a lot of it can be uh, only a few hours of content. Now games like The Witcher, uh, Witcher Three, which I had immense fun playing. Mm-hmm. Um, they have some DLCs that I'm considering picking up. It that game alone had a massive story, and uh, I think that if I recall right, the DLCs add just as much, if not more, content than the actual game itself. Yeah. So. CD Projekt Red did a really, really good job with that, and I kind of want to go back and play some more. Well, um, I just saw something recently on them. Did they recently put out some DLC? Uh, Blood and Wine, I think, was the newest one. Okay. Yeah, they've got two or three DLCs that they were going to release. I think it's three. And... Yeah, it adds just as much, if not more, content than the actual game itself. Nice. Yeah, that's one thing I've always hated, that they did the Call of Duty. Um, And actually, it kind of seems, well, PC-wise at least, uh, players are revolting against it. And the way they changed it is stupid. So they'll release release a map pack. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember back in like Modern Warfare 2, Modern Warfare 3, when they did that, everybody bought it. Everybody was playing on them because it was fun. It was new maps. Right. Um, And now all of a sudden they're just kind of rebooting maps. And like they're rebooting. Now they have three iterations of Nuketown. Yes. Uh, uh, That's not a DLC though. That came with the game if you bought, if you pre ordered it, I believe. Right. But even uh, then, you know, that's that's alienating a lot of players. A lot, cause, and I was one of them, because Nuketown's my favorite map. Right. It's fun. It's fast-paced. Um, you can level up super fast just because the games go quick. You can get a lot of kills. Mm-hmm. And it was fun. Um, but what they're doing now is rather than releasing them into a rotation, they are going, okay, well, here's all the regular play. And then you can click on this one where, like, because I play Hardcore Domination. That's my yep. favorite game style. And so I could go into Hardcore Domination. That'll give me the original maps. And now, I mean, obviously, anybody that plays Call of Duty that's listening knows um, this is more so for people that don't. Right. Um, so what they're doing now is they give you Map Pack, whatever name they put on it. Right. And it'll give you the option of Team Deathmatch, which I can't stand. Um, I like Team Deathmatch. I mean, Team Deathmatch is good uh, just to kind of blow off some steam. It can be. Um, but, but for me, it's like, okay, this is where all the tool bags go to play Call of Duty that run around with an SMG and snipe you across mm, the map. Right. I like objectives. So domination, capture the flag, things like that mm-hmm. I'm a big fan of. But there are just days where I'm like, I want to shoot some fool in the face mm-hmm. and do it repeatedly. Yeah. And Deathmatch and Team Deathmatch 
is good. If you can get a good team on Team Deathmatch, you can, you can do, do all right. Do all right, but the unfortunate thing in Call of Duty is the point of owning a game now is pretty much locking down their spawn and spawn killing everybody. Right, and it sucks. It's it's just not that's not fun to me. It happened a few times in Overwatch where we're just literally standing in front of the place where they spawn and just killing them as they walk out, and it's like, okay, guys, this isn't fun. Well, but with Overwatch, there's uh, there's Alternate so routes. many ways to get away from that. You've got Reinhardt with his shield. There are two or three exits from a the spawn, a spawn area. area. So if you can get somebody like uh, Tracer, you can just zip the heck out and you can flank them from behind and be like, <laughs> surprise! Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like I said, there only was a couple points that that happened. And that's what ended up happening. They got out behind us. But in Call of Duty... There's, that's like one of the banes of Call of Duty that mm-hmm. anybody that's playing. Like, oh, look at that nice spawn. Um, spawning on top of an enemy. Or spawning and then an enemy's like right there. Oh, yeah. That's a, that's a one thing that irritates me is when I spawn and a guy spawn runs does. around the corner. Yeah. Um, it's like, I remember hey, in, give me a chance, guys. I remember in Halo, uh-huh. um, we got a couple guys that I that I gamed with. We got super good. Mm-hmm. And you just start remembering spawn points on the maps. Yep. And you remember the spawn rotation. You keep an eye on it. And I remember one map. I can't, I can't remember the name of it. I think it was Halo 2. Um, but we literally stood in the middle of the map and threw grenades at spawn points. That's all we did. And you throw a sticky... The five second timer goes off on the spawn. Boop! You killed so and so. Next one's up. Throw a sticky. <laughs> Wait. Boop. Yeah. And uh, but anyway, so what they're doing is is so you get team deathmatch. Mm-hmm. You get normal objective play, mm-hmm. and that's just a mix of search and destroy, capture the flag, domination, and you obviously you get to vote. But if, say, you like to play Domination, you don't get to go play Domination. And then they're like, oh, yeah, there's those guys that like hardcore that actually like um, can take two bullets and you die. Not unloading a clip and a half into somebody and they finally keel over. Um, They like to play tactical. Then that's the game. That's the way I play. I've played hardcore since I started playing Call of Duty because it's more fun. Yeah, it was. In one of the last Call of Duties, it was like. Black Ops 2 was the last one I played online. Uh, I did play Ghosts, but I didn't play too much of that. Because it was on the one, and my crew, my buddy Gary, and uh, those guys, they didn't, they have yet to get a one. I went that direction. I managed to get mine for, eh, for pretty cheap. Plus, I was able to do some website work for a client, and uh, managed to buy... Our Xboxes traded ours in, bought the ones, but it was like in Call of in Black Ops Two or Black Ops, they wound up removing one of the playstyles, one of the hardcore playstyles that I liked. Uh, search and destroy. No, um, I want to say capture it was, the flag. I think because search and destroy is still in there. Uh, it might have been capture the flag. I think it was capture the flag. Yeah. Which really, really got me. Yeah, and the, it sucks. I mean, <clears throat> it's like why, you know, a lot of people played that. Mm-hmm. Why get rid of it? And people were, you know, like uh, guys, and they're just like, yeah, yeah, we don't care. You're gonna we're we're anyway. Activision. We uh, mm, oh yeah. yeah, Infinity Ward makes yeah, it's distributed by Activision. It makes the Black Ops series. Yeah. Infinity Ward makes um, the Modern Warfare series. And uh, Infinite War and yeah. Advanced War. <laughs> Treyarch and those guys. Yeah. Yeah, they're all just like, meh, screw you. We don't care. Yeah. And unfortunately, that's kind of the standpoint <laughs> they've taken with with the, the maps. Because, okay, oh yeah, there's those hardcore guys. They call it Hardcore Mosh Pit. So you can play, you can be playing Team Deathmatch, you can play Search and Destroy, you could play... It just rotates. It's, free-for-all, which I can't, I hate free-for-all. It's not fun. I like team-based games. Um, See, when I first got into uh, first-person shooters, free-for-all was pretty much it mm-hmm. <clears throat> until you got into the modding community. Mm-hmm. So when you played Doom, it was free-for-all. When you played Quake, it was free-for-all. 
when you started downloading the mods and getting into mods, uh, you got into the capture the flags or the team fortresses and those style of games. So it, uh, that's where I got my start, but it is, it's chaos. You have to be able to, you know, get to the mindset. If it moves, it dies. Yeah. Now you can't, you can't think it is a hundred percent reactionary. It's all Twitch gaming. Yeah. And that's, and that's another reason I like hardcore because you have to think because yeah. friendly fire is on. Absolutely. And, uh, you have to go, Oh, that's a teammate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What is he wearing a balaclava or is he wearing a helmet? <laughs> yeah. And it, actually the original reason I started playing hardcore was because I think modern warfare Two, uh, the RPG, Oh God. kids would just run into mo- into hardcore. And because I mean, you can mm-hmm. kill somebody with an RPG and you can, the splash damage was ridiculous still. And you could just team wipe with an RPG. Yep. And so I, in in regular, you'd spawn and somebody would run and pew, shoot the lane and kill the team. And it's like, God, this is stupid. And then you get a whole freaking team of people with RPGs, and it's just not fun anymore. Right. In hardcore, you can't because you could hit a teammate, you kill two people on the team, you're out. You're out of lobby. You're yeah. Booted, yeah. See, and that's when I played Soldier of Fortune two. We played with friendly fire on. Mm-hmm. It was competitive play. You, you yeah. just seriously think about okay, my guys are here. Yeah, you got to really plan your maneuvers. Mm-hmm. Hey, you know this guy's going down the ramp, and he's going to be cutting to the right. Okay, you got to watch the door to the left. If you throw that grenade, you better be able to throw that grenade or shoot that M two O three through that door without missing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because if you do, Don't splash damage is going to hurt him, maybe kill him, or it's going to bounce back and kill him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Hardcore definitely makes you think a little bit more about your shots. Mm-hmm. Speaking of Doom, um, one of the guys I follow uh, very closely on YouTube, it, it, he's just very anime. We spoke about him before, Slipgator. Right. Uh, he's doing a uh, playthrough on Doom, the new one. Right on. It looks pretty cool. Um, I've heard it's actually supposed to be pretty good. Mm-hmm. And I see that uh, I've seen some screenshots going through 9gag. Uh, or somebody's being like, yeah, I was playing through Doom, and all of a sudden this happened. And it's, uh, you can see the updated graphics and the HUD with the uh, gun and stuff, but it is uh, E1M1 from Doom, Episode 1, Map 1. Oh, really? Yep. I'm like, I, I know that level. <laughs> Like, that is, like, you go, you get your shotgun in the first room that's just off to the left. You come back down the stairs after you kill a couple of bad guys in there. Go around the hall to the to the left. Open the door, and... That's where you start. There's the room. I yep. mean, it's, that's the first big room you come to after you get... And that's the exact start of the game, because I, I saw his first episode, and that's all he's released so far, and that's exactly the start of the game. <laughs> Other than you start with a pistol with an, an, an infinite ammo. Yeah, the pistol in that game, I think... The charged pistol. You, you can charge it. You can either rapid fire it, or you can charge oh, it. Oh, see. In, in the original Doom, it was a 9mm, and I think... I think the pistol even had limited rounds. Mm. No, this one has a little infinite symbol. Hmm. Um, but yeah, you picked up the shotgun like first thing. The guy was like, "I got a shotgun already." <laughs> yeah, when you but you're playing Doom, remember? <laughs> yeah. And then he got the add-on for his shotgun to shoot the uh, the grenade rounds. That was pretty cool. Oh, cool. Yeah, I, I haven't seen a whole lot on the new Doom. Uh, I know that's still John Carmack's engine. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's his new uh, ID six or whatever they call it now, ID five engine, and uh, yeah, the guy's really good at doing the engines. I don't know who who did who did the level design, but uh, I understand that it's a really good game. So, 
I may pick it up. I don't know. But yeah, I may pick it up also. With Overwatch coming out, I, I doubt I'll take the time to play anything else. I'm just... That's why I pl- that's why I'm playing Uncharted and doing all these other little games. Uh, need to play some more. We picked up uh, Grim Dawn. We haven't played any of that since the first two times we played it. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of want to play a little bit more of that. The game seems interesting. I think that there's a decent storyline behind it. I really didn't get haven't had a chance to follow, but uh, they want to. I'll probably wind up picking that back up at some point just to you know play on the down days his name is not on any of it who Carmack yeah um it's ID Software yes which Bethesda now Bethesda owns. is the publisher yeah uh, but it looks like the designer's Jason O'Connell and the artist was Hugo Martin yeah probably level design and concept art mm-hmm. but yeah I know, I think Carmack is one of the guys also behind Oculus. Oculus Rift? Yep. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can verify that. I, I just watched a little documentary, and I know Carmack's engine is in the new Doom, and uh, it was, um, it got a lot of their uh, funding from licensing the engine. Mm-hmm. And they are no longer doing that. Okay. That is going to be basically for id and id games only. Rage was one of the ones with the new engine, and Doom is just an updated one. Okay. John Carmack. Yeah, he's a CTO of Oculus VR. And Armadillo Aerospace founder. He did Wolfenstein. Huh. Yeah, actually, Wolfenstein was the first... Uh, the first first-person shooter that the it guys came up with. Okay. Uh, yeah, the the interview with Carmack or not Carmack with John Romero that I saw uh, really went through the history of ID. Actually, it wasn't even that; it was just a history of ID. And it, you know, uh, one of their first games was a Commander Keen. And uh, they made you know, quite a bit of money off of that. It had a decent income, but the moment they released Wolfenstein, they made tons of money. Yeah. And that's why when they went, okay, we can do Keen or we can do first-person shooters, which is now making us a ton of money. So they uh, they stepped it up and created Doom. And Doom made them... <laughs> They thought they were making a lot of money before. Uh, what was it? Uh, Romero was able to go buy a Testarossa cash with the <laughs> money they were making off of it. <laughs> nice. It was a ridiculous amount of money. It's it's good. I'm, I'll actually link to the uh, to that uh, history of it. It's a YouTube video. Um, he still, I think he still plays Doom. Commander Keen is on Android now. Yeah, it, you got to think, man. The uh, the computers we had back when that was released, it was DOS based. Yeah, the, the those computers are way less powerful than a cell phone. A cell oh, phone yeah. outpowers those guys by leaps and bounds. Oh yeah, graphics wise, processor wise, RAM wise, it's yeah, no contest. And it's free. Yeah, I don't doubt that. Oh no, Commander Genius, that's not it. Commander Keen. Um, you probably find it on abandoned wear now. It's like uh, the original Doom. I think it's abandoned wear, so you can find free copies. Oh, the uh, DRM copies. Yeah, it's no DRM in them. If you find out, there's there's actually uh, a launcher for Windows, the new Windows Seven, Windows Ten, hmm. uh, just updated machines for Doom. You can go download that launcher, and then you just go find the WAD files. Uh, that's the extension they use, WAD. Mm-hmm. And you can... Actually, WAD files are still used in Android for uh, operating systems. Probably. But, uh, yeah, that's... I, I downloaded a copy of Doom and actually played through uh, a few levels of uh, Episode 1. Oh, really? Yep. Little nostalgia. <laughs> a lot of, lot of fun with that game. 
Well, I think on that note, I think that pretty much does it for this week, unless you have anything to, uh, else you want to talk about, any games, anything? No, uh, I do plan on streaming Overwatch on Twitch. Um, played around with OBS a little bit, but, uh, yeah, if you want to come take a watch, come watch. I'm the real Frosty on Twitch. Cool. We'll, uh, get the, uh, get that linked off the site also. But I guess that does it for this week. I'm Andrew. I'm Joe, and remember, if you can imagine it, you can print it.